你要准备好了 ，Natalie 来了。哎呦啊，姐姐他们要租房子，都被一楼了。为什么 ？Hello。Hello。How's your holiday? It was good. It was very good. The only thing I I worry about it. Either、um, tomorrow or the next day, my oldest son's supposed to get the COVID vaccine because、oh. he works. He works in the COVID unit at the、worker. hospital. Yeah,、oh. but he、okay. only because he works in the COVID units. But a lot of people that are getting it are getting very sick when they get it, and、I、then、see. they end up in the hospital. Okay. I, but <laughs> what does that mean? If let's say he's vaccinated, does that mean he can touch anyone? He doesn't need to wear the mask or? No, he still has to wear all the masks and take all the precautions, but he might just not get it as sick if he gets it. Oh, okay, okay, I see. But he could still catch it and bring it home to me. Oh, okay, <laughs> yeah. No, we we still walk around the house in our mask. It's、okay. only been a year. Hello, Longfa, how are you? Hello. Hello. How are you today? I'm fine. Your hair is so curly today. I like it. Mine is too. It's the weather. It makes it more curly here. How's the weather there? Every day it rains. I know. I looked up the weather in Singapore so I could see, and it is every day. It said rain. It rains a lot, doesn't it? Wow. And it's hot. It looks like you have a fan. Is it hot there? When it doesn't rain, it's hot. When it rains, it's cold. <laughs> oh no! What do you mean it's cold? It's cold. Yes. It... Because we ran in the rain. Oh. Well, here I'll tell you what the weather is here today. It's there is a flood warning because all the snow is melting because it got a little warm. So now, because it got warm, we're going to have lots and lots of rain, and I might have a big, a big pool at my house from the rain. And it's let's see.、Uh, Uh, what's the temperature here? It is currently what? Negative seven. It is nineteen degrees Fahrenheit, so it is negative seven degrees Celsius. Is it negative seven there for you too? No, I don't. I don't read the weather. <laughs> you don't read the weather. Oh, let's see. I'm curious now. What is the temperature in Singapore? The temperature is seventy-six. Seventy-six. I am negative nineteen. You are lucky. It's going to rain today. There is a thirty percent chance of rain. It's rained twice today. It already rained twice. Oh, well, at least you have rain. That's a good thing. Let's see. I have our chocolate touch book. Ta da! Are you ready to read? Okay. I have. Let's see. The last time we read, John was trying to take a test in school. But his pencil turned to chocolate, and his teacher was not very happy with him because his pencil turned to chocolate. And she said she'll speak to him after class. And he tried to write with his pencil, but the point was too soft, and he only made a chocolate smear where he was supposed to write the number seventy-two. 
So now we're on to chapter six. You read so quickly, I think we're going to finish it soon. When the others have been excused to go out for mid-morning play, John had to go and stand by Miss Plimsoll's desk. John, Miss Plimsoll said, you mustn't make up silly stories to excuse your field trust. I must have the truth. What did you do with your pencil? This is it, John said, showing Miss Plimsoll the pointed stick of chocolate. Really it is, it's changed. What do you mean it's changed, Miss Plimsoll demanded. That's my pencil, John tried to explain. Only it isn't the same anymore. Nothing stays the same today if I put it into my mouth. The same thing happened when I chewed my gloves. They were chocolate too. John said Miss Plim so slowly. Do you feel all right? Yes, thank you, John said. I feel all right, except he added, I'm getting so thirsty. The water from the water fountain turned to chocolate and so did the water upstairs. I would like a drink of cold water. Yes, John, Miss Plimsoll said. She suddenly looked pale. You run out and play with the others. I'm going to have a talk with the nurse. And John, Miss Plimsoll said, as he started toward the classroom door. Here's another pencil. Be a good boy and try not to lose it. I'm afraid if I have to keep this piece of chocolate until school's out. You know, we don't allow anyone to eat candy in class. Ms. Plimsoll put the slightly chewed chocolate pencil in her desk drawer and John went out to look for Susan. He found her skipping rope with two girls in his class. John usually scorned skipping rope. He preferred hide and seek, tag, FBI, spies, kick the can, or any other good, exciting game. Jumping up and down in one place just to avoid being hit by a rope seemed silly to him. But he was sorry for having spoiled Susan's silver dollar, and he was willing to make a sacrifice. Susan, he said. Susan continued to bounce on one foot as her two friends swung the rope over and under, over and under over and under her. She didn't seem to notice John. I'll skip with you, he offered. Susan stopped and the rope was caught by her shins. Let's try doubles, backwards, she said, but not to John. She ignored John. You go first, Betty. Ellen, you go second. I'll go last. The one who does the most times get the, gets the first slice of my birthday cake. Susan looked at John, raised her eyebrows, shut her eyes, and stuck out the tip of her pink tongue. Then she turned back to the girls and smiled. Ellen whispered in Betty's ear, and Betty whispered in Susan's ear. Then all three of them looked at John and at each other again and burst out laughing. Oh, Susan, John protested. I didn't mean to do it. The trouble is, there's something magic about me today. Everything I put into my mouth turns to chocolate. The girls giggled. You wouldn't like it, said John, who was beginning to feel sorrier for himself than he ever had felt before. I think it's getting worse, he added reproachfully. At first, just the part of my mouth turned to chocolate. But when I nibbled the end of my pencil, the whole pencil changed. Pooh, Susan said. The others hooted with glee. Maybe I'll get sick and die, John warned. Maybe I'll turn to chocolate myself. Then you'll be sorry. I don't believe one word about the chocolate, Susan said. And if it was true, you'd be glad because you all you ever like eating is chocolate. If you don't believe me, John retorted, just you give me that skipping rope and I'll prove it. Uh-oh. Go ahead, Longshu. The girls oh, no. looked questionably at each other for an instant, but as they hesitated, the bell rang and it was time to go back to the classroom. The rest of the morning passed slowly for John. He was afraid that his mother was going to be cross about the missing gloves. She might not accept the excuse that he had eaten them. He regretted his messed up automatic test. He was sad about Susan's anger and disbelief, and he was getting terribly thirsty. One doing ge geography and one doing art, he was excused to get a drink of water. Both times, however, he saw nothing but sweet chocolate. His mouth was getting stickier and sweeter and drier by the minute. 
Oh, no. What do you think is happening? Do you think he's going to turn to chocolate? Maybe. Maybe. It, his mouth is getting stickier and sweeter. Oh, no. Maybe his whole mouth will turn to chocolate. Oh, no. I wonder if he's going to be like King Midas and everything he touches is chocolate. All right, boys and girls, Miss Plimsoll said. It is almost time for lunch. Clear up your things. Paint pots securely closed, brushes washed, paintings unpinned, and laid out to dry. Drawing boards stacked against the wall. Ah, oh, there's the bell. First front row first, Timothy leading, then Robin in single file. Go. John alone walked slowly in the throng hurrying along the corridors to the school cafeteria. The school was proud of the cafeteria and the food served in it. The room was spacious and bright with windows all the way along one side overlooking the playground and the playing fields beyond. The opposite side was wholly taken up by the shiny silver service counter. Several boys and girls were already settled at tables by the time John took his place in line. Enviously, John noticed a boy at a nearby table suck at straws dipped in a milk bottle that was dull with frost. John could imagine the refreshing taste of cold, creamy milk. At another table, a group of girls were eating fat red cherries. John could almost feel the firm fruit on his tongue and the pleasure of biting through the tart, juicy pulp. The cherries must taste so good. They must be thirst quenching. John unhappily took a tray from the pile and slid it along the rails in front of the top of the counter. He put a paper napkin, a glass, and a gleaming spoon, a knife, and a fork on the tray. It seemed hardly worth the while, but he felt that he might as well try the food and drink. Perhaps if I eat in a different way, without letting anything touch my lips, my lungs won't all change to chocolate. He was not very hopeful. What? asked the boy standing next to him. Nothing, John said. I thought I heard you say something about chocolate. The boy said, I hope this is the day for chocolate cream pie. That's, that's be super. On chocolate cream pie days of the past, John had been known to skip the main course so that he might spend all his lunch money on the dessert. The thought of four pieces of chocolate cream pie suddenly made his stomach feel as if, as though he was on a roller coaster, an uneasy, flavorly, jerky sensation. John shuddered. Uki commented, wrinkling up his nose. The other boy struggled his shoulders and started to choose his meal. John took a plate of cold chicken and ham, potato chips, and a crisp moist lettuce and tomato salad. The white of the chicken, the pink of the ham, the gold of the potatoes, the pale green of the lettuce, and the red of the tomato looked delicious. He also took a half pint of milk, a thick crusted whole wheat roll, and a cool pad of butter, a tumbler of water with ice cubes clinking against the glass, and a dish of fresh fruit, slices of orange and grapefruit, and banana and grapes. That sounds really good. John's tray was loaded with just the sort of meal his mother was always trying to persuade him to eat. Until today, John had always thought it was pretty dull to eat sensible things when there were sweeter foods and drink to be had. Today, however, the sensible things looked most appetizing, and his mouth began to water in its new sticky way. John paid for the lunch with the money his mother had given him, went to an empty table, and sat down, his fingers trembling slightly with eagerness. He cut a slice of lettuce. His fork went through the leaves with a promising crunch. He struck, he stuck the prongs of the fork into the mouth sized piece of lettuce and carefully inserted it into his mouth. The lettuce didn't touch his wide stretched lips. John's teeth came together in crisp layers of sweet chocolate. Ugh. Your turn. He took a small piece of potato chip, tilted back his head until he was looking straight up at the ceiling, and dropped the morsel straight down his throat. 
He felt it go down, a sharp fragment of sweet chocolate. He tried the milk, the ice, water, the fruit. Every solid and liquid that he he sampled was transformed as soon as it entered his mouth. Then he became aware of a shocking novelty that he hadn't noticed at breakfast. At the rim of each grass, there was a small semicircle of, of brown. The bowl of his. The bowl of his. Spoon and the prongs of his frock had been become brown. Oh. John watched horrified. The areas of magic chocolate slowly spread until at last the glass and cut really were so, well solid chocolate. Mm. The trouble was questionably growing worse. John's scalp tightened with fear. What am I going to do? He asked himself miserably. Oh dear, oh dear, what is going to happen to me? Leaving his tray of chocolate food and drinks and utensils, John stumbled away from the cafeteria and out to the playground. Oh no. English class passed without incident. Miss Plimsoll distributed word lists for her pupils to take home. The more words you know, she explained as always, the more exactly you can think. There were some difficult new words, John noticed. Avarice, indigestion, acidity, unhealthiness, moderation, digestibility. As Miss Plimsoll explained the meaning of each one, it seemed to John as though they all had a special bearing on his present uncomfortable situation condition. At last, the bell rang. Very well, class, Miss Plimsoll said. Time for outside activities. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Miss Plimsoll. Miss Plimsoll gave the signal for dismissal, and the pupils in the front row filed out, followed by those in the second row, including John and Susan. Susan played a violin in the school orchestra, and usually she and John went to the rehearsals in the auditorium together. This time, Susan hurried on ahead of him. John followed very slowly. The members of the orchestra were sitting at the music, music stand on the auditorium stage when John, carrying his dark blue trumpet case, got to his chair in the brass section. Miss Quaver had already begun to explain a difficult passage to the girl who played the flute. Just after Jay sings, nestlings chirp and flee, she was saying, you come in if you're true, do, 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 do. do you see the place on your score? Good. Ah, John, Mrs. Quaver exclaimed. See, seeing him in his place. I'm glad you're not absent. As I have just told the others, this afternoon we're having the first joint rehearsal of my arrangement of a boy song by James Hawk. We've been all over the individual parts and all the section. You will recall, now it's time to fit the pieces together. John nervously opened his trumpet case and took his shiny, shining gold trumpet from its bed of scarlet velvet. The beautiful new instrument gave him confidence. He worked the valves nimbly with his fingers and looked up at Mrs. Quaver again. Now, John, she said, tell me when your little solo begins. Right after the end of the second verse, John promptly replied. He had practiced his part every evening in the basement at home for the last two weeks. He knew every note perfectly. After the line, that's the way for Billy and me. Uh-oh. What's going to happen when he plays his trumpet? Chocolate. He has to put it, yeah, he has to put it in his mouth to blow. <gasps> Uh-oh. I wonder if when he blows, he's going to spray chocolate on everyone like a water fountain. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Uh, good, Mrs. Quaver said. And don't forget what I told you, John. This is a happy song. I want you to play ta-ta, 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 simply repeating the rhythm of the voice. And I want you to be light and lively. This is supposed to be the song of a boy who loves romping in the country. Ta-ta, 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 John thought. Huh, that shouldn't be too difficult even with the whole orchestra listening to him. 
He had played it over and over again at home, but he would have to try extra hard here. This was to be his first solo. Everyone else was depending on him to play it properly. Right, Mrs. Quaver said brightly. With her baton, she rapped sharply, twice sharply, on the music stand before her. All the musicians brought their instruments into playing position. Susan poised her bow over the strings of her violin. John held his trumpet close to his mouth and wiggled his fingers on the valves. Mrs. Quaver's baton moved from side to side, up and then down. The cymbals clashed and the drums thumped. The pianist brought his fingers down on the ivory keys of the piano. The violinists and cellists made their weeing and whomping sounds. All were in perfect unison. The rehearsal had begun. After the introduction, one of the older boys began to sing. Where the pools are bright and deep. Where the grey trout lies asleep. Up the river and over the lea. That's the way for Billy and me. <gasps> After the last line of the first verse, John's fellow trumpeter echoed the rhythm of the singer's voice. Ta-ta, ta-ta, ta-ta-ta, ta-ah-ah. Mrs. Quaver smiled approvingly at the successful performance and with a baton gave the singer the signal to begin the second verse. Where the black bird sings the latest and oboe went peep. Where the hawthorn blooms the sweetest, where the nestlings chirp and flee, the flute warbled across according to the plan. That's the way for Billy and me. John swallowed with an effort and put the mouthpiece of his trumpet to his lips for his solo. The mouthpiece instantly changed to chocolate. Then, mm -hmm. at fast, the chocolate spread along the instrument, mm. changing all the flashing gold into dull brown. Oh, the no. Go ahead. Oh, I can't watch. Go ahead. <laughs> the first note came out fairly true. Oh, but the chocolate trumpets cannot stand withstand much pressure. The hole in the mouthpiece softened and clogged up. And the valves stuck as John desperately tried to finish his part. Mrs. Quaver's eyes almost popped out of her head as she listened to him play. Ta ta, tu, ta tu, 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 tu. It sounded as though John was trying to play a soap filled bubble pipe. Terribly flustered, he put down his trumpet. Mrs. Quaver was speechless. The orchestra was rocked by uproarious laughter. The other trumpeter leaned over toward John's chair and picked up the trumpet. It's a chocolate trumpet, he shouted derisively. No wonder it sounded like that. John Midas was trying to play a chocolate. John didn't want to hear anymore. He fled from the stage and out to the playground. Without stopping even to look around, he ran through the stone gateway and homeward. Oh, I think he feels very embarrassed. Look how oh, sad he looks. the shame of it, the humiliation. John wept breathlessly as he ran, shocked and frightened, indigent and angry at the world that suddenly turned against him. Mean old things, John thought, blaming Miss Plimso and Miss Mrs. Craver for his filters, even though nothing that had happened to him had been their fault in any way. Horrible old school, he thought, even though he had liked school until that morning. Hateful Susan, he thought, even though he knew at the same time he was really longing for her to be friendly with him again. Through the window, Mrs. Mida saw John coming up the pathway. Hello, John, dear, she called from the living room. You are home early today. How nice. As a reward, there will be a piece of chocolate after supper. I hate that, John shouted. He was crying too hard to say anything else for a moment. When, when she heard the sound of his voice, Mrs. Meadows rushed into the hall. Why, what's the matter, dear? she asked, putting her arm around him. John twisted away from 
Her dress ran past her and started up the stairs towards his bedroom. Aww, he's really upset. I feel terrible for him. Susan doesn't want me at her birthday party, he said as he went. I know she doesn't. Well, I don't want to go to her rotten old party anyway. But I don't, th I don't think you really mean that, Mrs. Midas said. Besides, she added, and John was halted by the softness of her voice. Mrs. Buttercup just telephoned to say she was going to drive over herself at four o'clock to pick you up. She did, John said, blinking down at his mother from the top of the stairway. Yes, she did, Mrs. Midas assured him. So you'd better hurry and get yourself washed and brushed. Your party clothes are laid out on your bed. There were on the buttercup's lawn while it was still warm enough outside. Later, the party supper, including the birthday cake, was going to be served indoors, and there will be a magician and a short movie. John joined in the blind man's buff and grandmother's footsteps and fox and geese, and soon he became more cheerful. He even temporarily forgot about ch chocolate. Suzanne looked very pretty. Her yellow curls had been brushed so hard they looked silkier than ever. She was wearing a big blue ribbon the same color as her eyes. Her cheeks were flushed with excitement, a deeper pink than her new party dress. On her feet were dainty little white socks and white shoes with straps that button. Between the games, John Susan smiled at John and said, I'm glad you came. They seem to be on good terms again. Then Mr. Buttercup approached, bringing a bucket of water from the garage. He set it down in the middle of the lawn without spilling a single drop. We're going to duck for apples, Susan whispered to John. The boys against the girls. He can be the captain of the boys' team. The two teams lined up for the race. Suzanne leading, leading the girls and John the boys. The idea is this, Mr. Buttercup explained. When I say go, not yet, John. Suzanne and John will run to the bucket. There are 12 apples floating in the bucket and 12 people in the race. Using only their teeth, Suzanne and John will grab their apples and run back to their lines. As soon as they touch the hand of the number two runners in their teams, Dini and Duncan, Suzanne and John will go to the end of their line, and Dini and Duncan will run to the bucket to duck for the apples. Do you understand the way it's going to work? All right, one, two, one to get ready, two to get steady, and three to go. Oh, no. Oh, no. What's going to happen when he dunks his face in the bucket to grab an apple? The whole bucket is going to turn to the ah! I think you're right. I think the whole bucket. Let's see. Susan bounded ahead like a jackrabbit and had her face deep in the bucket by the time John reached her side and crouched down for his apple. He got his eye on a big red one with its stalk jutting up conveniently for him to grab. He lowered his face, opened his mouth, and lunged. Somehow, his nose reached the apple before his teeth did and pushed it below the surface of the water. Ah! John's mouth followed the apple down. Then a terrible thing happened. The clear water in the bucket turned into dark brown, sweet, liquid chocolate. Susan and John immediately pulled their heads up, but it was too late. Their faces were drenched with chocolate syrup. Oh, Susan exclaimed, wiping chocolate out of her eyes. Chocolate syrup dripped down all over her delicate, pale pink dress. Oh, she moaned. John was in the same state. There was chocolate all over his face. There was chocolate on his white shirt front and on his gray flannel shorts. And there was chocolate in his mouth. Glug, John said. Glug. Susan was too surprised and angry to speak. For the second time that day, she turned her back on John and ran away from him. Mrs. Buttercup offered to clean John up, but he couldn't bear to stay at the party another minute. He started off at once for home. 
Dragging along and thinking of all the dreadful things that had happened, John had walked about halfway home when he heard the cheery voice of his father. Hello, hello, called Mr. Midas, crossing over from the side, other side of the street. He was on his way home from the station. You left the party rather early, didn't you? What? Mr. Middle had just seen the patches and streaks of chocolate that were drying on John's face and on his clothes. Good gracious, he said. No wonder you left the party early. How did that happen? John burst into tears. It had all been so awful. But now he could tell his father about his terrible day. He stopped crying and only stifled a little now and then as he told the whole story about taking the coin to the candy store, about buying the box that had turned out to have only one chocolate in it, about toothpaste, about the breakfast, and the globe, the silver dollar, the pencil, the lunch, the trumpet, and finally the apple ducking water. Oh my, he had quite a day. <laughs> you mean to tell me they really all turned to chocolate? Mr. Midas asked. You're sure you didn't imagine some of this? Oh, no, John assured him. Well, Mr. Midas said, still looking doubtful, we're only a couple of blocks from that candy store of yours. Not that I've ever noticed one there. Suppose we stroll over and ask the man whether his chocolates always do strange things to people? It's on the next corner, John said, recognizing some of the houses on the side street. Not the next house. Not the next house, not the next, he said, but John's voice faded into silence. The corner where he had found the candy store was nothing now but an empty lot. Flat open ground littered with a pile of rusty tin cans and broken bottles around a splintery old sign saying, for sale. Hmm, said Mr. Midas, frowning anxiously at John. I think we'd better pay a, doc a visit to Dr. Cranium before we go home. That's where the store was, though, John protested, beginning to cry again. He had shed more tears in that one day, it seemed, and certainly eaten more chocolate than in all other days of his life put together. I know it was. Your turn. Dr. Cranium was a busy man. As luck would have it, however, he was able to see Mr. Midas and John almost at once. Well, 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 said Dr. Cranium. <laughs> And how are we getting along now, John? Have we cut down on our candy? Huh? How do you do? John responded duly. Unfortunately, he's had a bad day, Dr. Cranium, Mr. Midas said. Trouble at school, you know, and a little accidentally, as accident, accident at a birthday party. What I'm worried about is that he keeps saying that everything he puts to his mouth turns to chocolate. No more than a nursery fan to see, I'm sure. And Dr. Cranium turned to Mr. Midas. Well, John, he went on, looking down with a smile. I suppose you tell me in, in your own words what the matter seems to be. Everything I put into my mouth turned to chocolate, John explained. Everything I eat and everything I drink changes to chocolate. I'm thirsty and I'm getting a pain, a bad one, I think. Dr. Cranium sighed patiently and invited John to open his mouth and say, Ah, ah, John said. Dr. Cranium peered into John's mouth briefly and gave a low whisper of surprise. The chocolate eating simply must stop. He went to a supply cabinet. I don't think there's any time to be lost, he told Mr. Midas. I'm going to give the boy some of my own special compound, Dr. Cranium's elixir, I call it. Never fails. Dr. Cranium selected a large bottle from one of the cabinet's crowded shelves. He removed the top from the bottle. He got a spoon from another shelf. He filled the spoon with an oily greenish yellow medicine that had a yellowish reddish lights glinting in it it doesn't taste very pleasant dr cranium warned john in a pleasant tone of voice but i'm sure it'll do the trick clear the stomach and cl you clear the mind that's what i always say what is that is that chocolate 
No. You're going to get it on your sister. No. <laughs> Dr. Cranium offered John the brimful spoon. Must I? John asked his father. I know it'll turn into chocolate. Go on, Mr. Midas nodded encouragingly. Drink it down. What do you think? Is it going to turn to chocolate too? What is, is that, is that silly putty? What is that, clay? No. Glu gum. What is Glue it? Stick. Glue stick. Glue stick? Glue stick. Ooh. Is it Glue. sticky? Yes. Ooh. Glue stick. You don't eat it, do you? No. Oh, good. It looks sticky. It's an eraser. What? No way. An it's an eraser. No, it, that sticky, gooey thing is an eraser? Yeah. How do you erase if it's so sticky? It's not sticky. It's like it's just, clay. It's, it's like just clay. clay. It's like it's clay. Just, wow. Like clay. Think, wow. Okay, that's the coolest eraser I've ever seen. I don't have any erasers like that. I have sticky stuff like this, but it's just it's just sticky. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't erase. Blue tech. That. That's just, blue tech. Yeah, this is like slime. They call this um, thinking putty. This just, is blue tech. Wow. Huh. I learned something new. You guys have super cool erasers. Okay. John's going to put this into his mouth. Do you think the medicine's going to turn to chocolate medicine? You know what? I might not mind taking medicine if my medicine turns to chocolate. Here he goes. John took the spoon between his lips. The medicine turned to chocolate. The spoon turned to chocolate. John choked and sputtered and the chocolate syrup spurted from his mouth. <laughs> Your turn. Dr. Cranium dropped the spoon in alarm. When it struck the white tilted floor, the chocolate mm. handle snapped several pieces. Mercy, said Dr. Cranium. I've never seen anything like it. The boy's whole system seems so chocolatefied that it <laughs> chocolatefies everything it touches. After he recovered somewhat, the doctor went out. I believe this must be an unpredicted case of uh, chocolate lattice. I shall call it cranium's disease. I want to make an exotic study of the child. Mm. I I think John has enough excitement for one day, said Mr. Midas. Mr. Midas was much upset when Mr. when Mrs. Midas was much upset when Mr. Midas told her that John had Dr. Cranium's disease. He said it was chocolateitis, Mr. Midas explained, a worried frown on his face. But he's calling it cranium's disease because it was his discovery? Dr. Cranium didn't do it, John said. It's magic. It all started after I ate that chocolate. I'm scared, he added. Mrs. Midas sat down and dabbed her eyes with a lace handkerchief. She was crying. Mr. Midas blew his nose, and he had to attend to something abruptly and left the room. Oh, I think Dad's crying, too. John had been so busy feeling sorry for himself that he had not realized how his mother and father would feel about his chocolate disease. Never mind, Mother, he said, putting his arm around her shoulders. It's all right, really. Nothing was all right, but he, could, he couldn't bear to see his mother's tears. He kissed her wet cheek. His eyes were shut as his lips softly touched her, so he didn't see the change right away. Oh, no. Then his lips began to feel sticky. He opened his eyes. His mother had turned into a lifeless statue of chocolate. <gasps> it is just like Mr. Midas. <gasps> Your turn. Oh, no. John ran wildly out of the house without thinking where he was going or what he was going to do. All he knew was that somehow he must get help. For the first time in a long while, he forgot about himself altogether. Now he didn't care about anything but bringing his mother back to life. 
Without knowing how he got there, John found himself at the corner where he had bought the chocolate box. The lot was no longer an untidy rubbish dump. The neat red brick building with two show windows were exactly, were exactly where it had been in the first place. But the display of candy I had previously seen in the windows were no longer there. In one window, John saw a chocolate trumpet, a chocolate pistol, <gasps> and a silver dollar of a piece bitten out of it. In the <gasps> other window, he saw a cafeteria tree littered with chocolate utensils and the remains of a chocolate lunch. Clearly, this place was the right one. Clearly, the proprietor must know a lot about John's hateful chocolate touch. John rushed into the store. The proprietor was standing behind the counter, carefully polishing something small and round and fat and, and silver. I was just thinking of you, he said. John had no time to waste on pleasantries. <gasps> Remember the old coin I found and I gave you and you gave me a match chocolate? He demanded. Without waiting for a reply, he babbled on. I ate it and it made everything that touches my mouth turn into chocolate and I kissed my mother and now she's chocolate and I've got to change her back. Easy now, murmured the storekeeper. Calm yourself. There was an expression of satisfaction in the old man's eyes. It's all your fault, John declared. If my mother isn't made better again, I'll fight you till you're dead. My goodness, the storekeeper exclaimed. Whose fault did you say? Yours, John said. If you hadn't taken my money, I wouldn't have. Now, John, the storekeeper interrupted. I must insist on honesty. I'm glad to hear you're thinking about your mother for a change. Unselfishness is important, but honesty is also important. If you'll be truthful, perhaps I can help you. John's ears reddened. It was becoming unmistakably evident to him that he had only himself to blame for all this unhappiness. He looked straight into the storekeeper's eyes. I'll do anything. I'll work for you all my life for nothing if you'll turn my mother back. You can turn me to chocolate instead if you want. You, your turn. The storekeeper apparently ignored John's offers. You were right, John, he said, when you guessed that I had something to do with your acquiring chocolate touch. But you earned yourself, but you, you yourself earned the coin that's bought the chocolate touch. Only greedy people can even see that kind of money. Dr. Cranium was right up to a point. I suppose that one could say you're chocolate latest, but it was just an Outward sign of selfishness. My mother, John reminded the storekeeper frantically. My mother's turned to chocolate. Do something about it. Oh, please do something about it. I'm glad you are concerned, the storekeeper commented unhurriedly. unhurriedly. Part of the cure is to be concerned about other people. You have to be so greedy that you did, didn't care what happened to other people. Oh, I know, I know, John admitted woefully. But please decide about me later, and please make my mother better now. Well, John, the storekeeper said, if you had to choose between getting rid of a chocolate touch and restoring your mother to life, which would it be? For one moment, John couldn't help imagining a future of all chocolate mills. The thought, the thought was terrible. But the thought of his mother as she had been when he left her, a motionless chocolate statue, unable to speak, her chocolate hand still holding her lace handkerchief. Without further hesitation, John said, help my mother. Well, John, the storekeeper said, I'm going to give you another chance. When, when next you go to school, your chocolate pencil will be a real wooden pencil with lead in it. But... John began to protest. What did a pencil matter? The, the chocolate knife and fork and spoon you left on your tray in the cafeteria will turn back to metal. Your chocolate trumpet will become shiny golden one again. But John said, don't worry about the Dr. Cranium spoon. You'll find a whole silver one on the floor. 
where the bo broken chocolate lay. But how about John said? Susan and Buttercup would discover the chocolate stains on her party droop. Party dress and party shoes were nothing but water. After all, her silver dots, after all, her silver dollar will be all right. John could stand the suspense no longer. My mother, what about my mother? Will she be all right? The star keeper smiled. Why don't you run along home and find out, he suggested. John turned without even saying goodbye and ran out of the store. The star keeper went back to the disc he had been polishing, a disc the size of a quarter. It had to be polished smooth, ready for a new set of tubes in case he needed them should arise. Oh no, he's going to give the coin to another child. He's polishing it. That's the one John found. The front door was open, and John rushed into the living room where he had left his mother. She was not there now, but on the chair was a small, wet lace handkerchief. John ran into the dining room and on to the kitchen. As he came to the kitchen door, he heard the ring of silver against crockery. He saw a wonderful sight, his mother arranging the coffee things on a tray. He dashed into the kitchen and flung his arms around his mother's waist, sobbing and laughing with relief and joy. There, there, said Mrs. Midas, stroking his hair from John's forehead. You've had a very disturbing day, dear, but in a few minutes, we're all going to have supper and everything will be fine again. Goodness, I do believe I need to get my, I need some coffee myself. I felt so strange then in the other room. I really don't know what came over me. The front door, the door of the garage, of the garden opened and Mr. Midas came in. Before we settle down, Mrs. Midas said to John, have a glass of good cold milk. You look so hot. Your turn. So they didn't know what had happened to her. Well, John thought he certainly couldn't scare them by telling them. He watched gratefully as his mother took a frosty blue jug from the refrigerator and poured from, from, poured from it a glass full of icy creamy milk. Trembling with nervousness, John tilted the glass against his open mouth. The liquid flowed in and down his throat and remained purely milky, delicious milky, tasting of nothing but fresh, clean milk. After the first long, wonderful gulps, he suddenly recalled that he had not thanked the storekeeper for saving his mother. Mother, he said, may I go out for a minute? I'll be right back. All right, John, but supper will be ready in 10 minutes. Don't keep us waiting. John ran briskly down the street until he came to the corner where he turned right when he was going to Suzanne's house. Then he turned left instead and started along the two blocks of unfamiliar street leading, leading to the candy store. He soon came to the corner of the rather red bit brick red brick building had been but there was no, no building and no store and of course no storekeeper in the corner lot there was nothing to be seen but a heap of rusty tin can and broken bottles and surrounding signboard with new lettering that says sold oh it's gone again nice job we did it we finished the book what do you think would happen next? Another person will pick up pick up the coin and have the chocolate touch. I think you're right. And his mom doesn't even remember that she was ever chocolate. Oh, let's see. John Midas is blank about candy. Greedy. Yes, greedy is the right word. Dun, dun, dun. Number two, what is the main conflict in this book? Hmm. Everything, John, everything John touches turned to chocolate. Let's see. This is a tricky question. I think I could choose either one. Ah, you're right. What is John's attitude at first when but things start turning to chocolate? But not touch it. He everything put on the mouth, not touch. That's right. Everything he put in his mouth. It wasn't everything he touches. 
That's why I wasn't sure about that question. I thought they wrote it incorrectly. He's thrilled. That's right. He is thrilled. Number four. What happens to Susan's silver dollar birthday present? It turns into chocolate and John eats it. You got it. Number five. When John goes to band class, there are lots of musical instrument sounds such as peep and ta-ta, ta-ta. Do you know what these are examples of? Do you know any of these words? I'm not sure if you know this yet. Hey, you can write on the screen. <laughs> Do you know these words? A simile is when two words, when you compare two things and say a bird is like a feather or a, a paper is like a feather. A metaphor means you say something is something else. Alliteration means that you use words that all start with the same sound, like big blue babies. And the last one is a word called automatopoeia. It's when you, yes, yes, hey, you're writing and I see words. <laughs> That's exactly it. Nice job. Uh-oh, now we have to clear it. <laughs> Why does John eventually burst into tears? He's sad he doesn't have more chocolate. He's frustrated and sad that everything is turning into chocolate or he didn't get enough sleep. Whoa, whoa, you're like magical. Ah. <laughs> you know how to use this very well. What do you think? Why does he burst into tears? Oh, I can't hear you. Your sound disappeared. But I know you know the right answer. You, ah, ah, and you can click it. <laughs> what is the cure to the chocolate touch? Is it a sense of humor, greed, cleverness, unselfishness? And last one, what is the main theme of the chocolate touch? Friendship, greed, family, or love? Hmm. This is a tricky question, too. What is the main theme? Let's see. Let's see. I agree with you. I think you're right. Let's try. I think they, they were going for greed. They wanted to say that the whole book is being about, about being greedy. Nice work. 100%, of course. Well done. Dun, dun, dun. Whoosh. Whoa, we earned, whoa, 380 points. Nice job. You did amazing today. I have a project for you, but I will send it to your dad so that you can look at it. There were different things that we can do with chocolate. And I wanted to see if you would choose one so that we can do either research or a project and practice presentation. Actually, you did a great job today. Thank you for reading with me. You're a fantastic reader. I can't hear you anymore, but I can see you. I, oh, oh, I can hear you again. Yes, I can definitely hear you again. <laughs> You're so smart. Thank you for reading with me. Thanks for reading The Chocolate Touch. Did you like it? I can't hear you again. Oh, no, what happened? Oh, no. I see a smile. I think you might have liked it. Oh, I can hear you. Would you like it if everything you touched turned to chocolate? I wouldn't either. Especially when he hugged his mother. I was so sad. I was so worried for him because I remember what happened to King Midas when he touched his daughter and she turned to chocolate. <sighs> well, you did a wonderful job today. I read another 
story Percy Jackson and another story and it says King Midas liked his daughter in, in gold. What? Oh no. Oh my goodness. I wonder if he did like his daughter being in gold. I thought he didn't. And because because the stories the and the other story said that he keep a lot of gold statues in his room. Oh I see. Huh. Well, I guess we'll have to find out if King Midas really did like his daughter being gold. He had a son. He had a son? Oh, I didn't know that. I wonder if his son was also gold. His son was a sword fighter. Was he gold? No. Oh. <laughs> I guess he didn't give him a hug or a kiss. Longshu, you did great today. I will show you our pro I will email your dad all the different projects so you can look at them and then we'll figure one out next time in class. Have a good night. I'll see you next time. Good morning. Oh, thank you. Good night. <laughs> ah!